Thank you for tuning in to the sermon podcast from Redeeming Hope. We exist as a family of faith that follows Jesus and helps others find him by living all of life as missionaries of hope. If you want more information about our church or would like to support our ministry, go to our website at redeeminghope.org. Please enjoy the sermon podcast. Continuing our series, uh, Cross and Crown, really the two themes of the Gospel of Mark, um, Christ's crown, we, we see him coming to us as the king, establishing a new kingdom, and he's really showing us in the Gospel of Mark what the world's going to look like when Jesus is in charge. We get a glimpse of it, and uh, we see him moving from scene to scene, almost like an action hero, doing amazing things, which is what we're going to see today as we see Jesus the king come and preach the Gospel of the kingdom. But then what we'll see later on as we Continuing the Gospel of Mark, is it's almost like the Gospel of Mark switches from a major key to a minor key as Jesus starts his steady march toward the cross, and it culminates with his cross and resurrection. Now, uh, as we get into today, I am going to give a a disclaimer sort of announcement, um, and I'm going to concede that uh, Josh's visual last week with the mustard seed was really slick. I mean, did you come in last week wondering what the heck was going on with that thing taped to the side of your chair? You know, as we think, that's a pill. What's going on here? Well, it was, it was a mustard seed because he preached on the, the, the text of the mustard seed. Great illustration to the point where even this week, like, it's a gift that keeps on giving. Uh, I know, uh, you know, we've had the mustard seed taped on the dashboard of Heidi's car. It's just a reminder that every small thing she does is a big thing for Jesus. I know Bill over here is sending me pictures of his mustard seed, like, growing up out of, the, out of his potted uh, soil that he has. And, and I'm thinking, dang, I think, I think when it comes to visuals, since I've been here, I think Josh won so far. So this is a, a, a disclaimer announcement. I do not have the visual today to beat that visual, but I will eventually have a visual that will retake the top spot at some point in the near future. It was a busy week for me, and I wasn't that, I actually thought about bringing my canoe in, because you'll see the text today. But... <laughs> you're wondering, so you're wondering what the canoe is on the side of your chair. It's going to be something like that, okay? It's going to be something like that, because it's going to be really, really good. Okay. Today, we're in Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. The title of today's message is Master of the Storm, and I hope the title alone encourages you, no matter what storm you're in right now, um, or have been in, that you see Jesus for who he is in the midst of that. Mark 4, 35 through 41, I'm reading out of the ESV. On that day... When evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and the other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is God's word. You know, I always remember when I preach the word, it always comes to me because there's that moment, and I think anybody who preaches the word has that moment where you realize that God's going to use you today to speak his word, and there's a sense of weakness and a sense of inadequacy that can hit. And I remember Charles Spurgeon, the great prince of preachers, would say that as he, in his words, ascended the sacred, the sacred desk, he's talking about the pulpit, he would step up you know, in England to that high pulpit that they had in his church at the time, and every step he would say, I believe in the Holy Spirit, I believe in the Holy Spirit, I believe in the Holy Spirit. And so this morning, I confess, I believe in the Holy Spirit. And let's pray for his help today. Lord, the speaker and the hearer are weak today, both alike. We need your grace. I need your grace to speak and share, and the hearer needs grace to hear. We ask for your spiritual power to be at work in your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. So storms come into our lives, like this storm came into the disciples' lives, and I think it's, it's a nice metaphor that the whole text starts with when evening had come. You know, it's getting dark. 
Uh, it's a dark season. It's a dark moment. It's a dark chapter. Maybe you can relate to that. Maybe evening has come. Or maybe you're right in the middle of it. And storms come into our lives like the disciples. And like the disciples, we also ask Jesus, Jesus, do you not care that we are perishing? Don't you care? Don't you see what is going on in our lives? Don't you see what is going on in our family, in our marriage, in our finances, in our relationships, in our country? Today, here's what we're going to talk about. Jesus' response to the storm, Jesus' response to his disciples, and then our response to Jesus, okay? So how did Jesus respond to this storm? What do we see him doing? And then how does he interact with his disciples? And then how do we interact with this text, and how do we interact with him as a result of this? So let's talk about Jesus' response to the storm. I think we see two things. It's actually a twofold response. We see Jesus sleeping, and we see him stopping, sleeping and stopping, stopping the storm. Sometimes Jesus sleeps in the storm, and it kind of looks like he doesn't care to the point where the disciples actually ask that question. But what we need to understand is that God's disposition toward this storm and toward your storm is not disinterest or uncaring. It's peace. What you see in Jesus in this text is not disinterest. It's peace. And what you see in Jesus when he doesn't immediately react to your panic or my panic, right? It takes me about 48 hours to feel like God has utterly abandoned me. I can feel great today. I can walk out of church on Sunday like, man, God's doing great stuff. I feel so good. It could be literally Tuesday afternoon. And I'm like, why do you hide when darkness comes? <laughs> Jesus, why are you sleeping? It's just our hearts. We, we just lose sight of him and we, and we misinterpret him. And that's what they were doing. He was at peace. They thought it was him being disinterested and uncaring. But that's not at all what it was. He's not worried. He can sleep because he knows the end from the beginning. Psalm chapter 2 says, The one who sits in heaven looking at his enemies laughs. That's God's disposition toward his enemies, which, by the way, are your enemies. He literally laughs. Why? Because he sees the end from the beginning. He knows the story. Recently, as a church, Josh mentioned the Bible reading plan. We read through the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis in our Bible reading plan. And anytime my reading takes me to the story of Joseph, my favorite Old Testament story, so much in it that encourages us. We did a series last year on the story of Joseph. And what we see is that Joseph suffered many things for a long time. But in the end... He said to his brothers who betrayed him, and it's right here, Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. He said, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. You see that? He says, you meant evil. Evil was done to me. You did it. You're, you're responsible for it. But God was actually even behind it, arranging it, and allowing it for his sovereign purposes. God wasn't worried the whole time because God saw the end from the beginning. And, of course, with Joseph, we have the benefit of having the end of his story, right? We're looking at Joseph freaking out in the middle of the story and all these terrible things happening. And we're like, Joe, Joe you're fine, man. Just turn a couple pages over. Right, you're fine, see? You become the second in command in Egypt, and, and you saved your family, and you saved the world. It's great. He doesn't see that. You don't see the end of your story either. And in stories like Joseph, the New Testament says what's written in the days of old, the Old Testament, was written for our instruction that we might have hope. So we can look at stories like Joseph, and his story can stand in for my story. Because I don't have the end of my story. You don't have the end of your story. But the way that God worked with Joseph, God meant it for good. God had intention, even in the storm, for Joseph, it was storms. Joseph didn't see what was going on until the end. But God saw it the whole time. And now, now we get this picture of God incarnate, God wrapped in flesh in Jesus, and we get to see, literally see what God looks like in the middle of a storm. He's sleeping, in, in a sense. Jesus is physically sleeping. He's so at peace. What we see is peace. And like we said in our series on Joseph last year, if you want to be encouraged in pain and suffering and, and God working all things for the good, go back and listen to that series. It's really encouraging. 
what we see is this, that God's silence is not absence. Jesus can sleep in the storm because the storm is not a threat to him. And therefore, because we're united with Christ, it's ultimately not a threat to us. So we see Jesus sleeping. That's his first response to the storm. And it's a picture of his sovereignty and a picture of his peace. But also, we see Jesus responding to the storm by stopping it. Sometimes he sleeps, and sometimes he stops, depending on what the timing of God's will is for what he wanted to accomplish through that storm in the hearts and lives of those that are involved in it. So here we see Jesus. He stands up. He wakes up. The disciples have this conversation with him. He stands up, and he literally says to the storm, peace be still, and the storm stops. And like, they were kind of around Jesus for a while already. Like, they probably had meals with him around the fire, and like, he's, he's a dude. But at the same time, they're like, who the heck is this guy? He literally talks to the weather, and the weather obeys him. Who is this? So the fact that sometimes Jesus sleeps and sometimes Jesus stops shows us who he is in relation to the storms of our lives and the storms of their lives. You know, we often pray, you hear people, it's, Christians are famous for praying for a hedge of protection around other Christians. Lord, I just pray a hedge of protection around my brother as he goes. And, and, and what, what we see in Scripture is that you actually don't need to pray that. God's already got that covered. He's got a hedge of protection around every single believer. However, he's the gatekeeper of that hedge of protection. And he controls the flow of what comes in and out of that gate. He controls the flow of the intensity of a storm, the duration of a storm. And he also controls when it starts and when it stops. When he says enough, that's enough. And here Jesus decides, it's enough of the storm, stop. That's it. And they're like, what? Like, we know he can do awesome things, but he can actually talk to the weather? This, th who is this guy? And I think they saw what we need to see in that Jesus stopping the storm with his voice shows his godness. That Jesus ain't just another prophet in a series of prophets, another good man in a series of good men, another humanitarian or revolutionary in a series of humanitarians and revolutionaries. Jesus is altogether different. The prophets pointed to someone coming, Jesus is the point. He is the full manifestation of the prophecies of the Old Testament of the coming Messiah. And what they didn't realize is that it would be God himself. By his voice, he said, peace be still, and the storm was stopped. But if Jesus is truly God wrapped in flesh, should that surprise us? Because the whole Genesis account of the creation of the world was the same thing, wasn't it? God said, let there be land and sea. And by his voice, his, literally God's words have power to create. So cannot the voice that says, let there be, also say, let there not be, and stop the storm at a word? And that's what we see happening here. And I think this should encourage us, this little side note, this should encourage us on the power of God's word. And I'm not, I'm not saying like this kind of name it and claim it, use the word of God like an incantation over things. I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying, though, is God's word as we preach it and hear it and encourage one another in it in Sunday gatherings and in groups and in our friendships and our conversations, God's word has creative power to create stuff in us. That's why we listen to it. Because literally listening to it has power to create life and fruitfulness and the joy of the Lord and spiritual power. But it also has stopping power. God's word creates life and it stops storms and it stops death. Uh, we had a friend, my wife and I have a, a dear friend, who came to Christ when he was in his early 20s, when we were part of a ministry in Texas. <clears throat> a few years later, kind of fast forward the tape, he, he, uh, he get, his life got derailed. He got married, and he just really didn't prioritize the Lord in his life. And, and over the years, just kind of sowed a bad harvest in his marriage, and that, that, that kind of came up in his life, and his wife was leaving him, and so he reaches out to us in the midst of this terrible storm. And uh, Heidi was just texting with him a lot. Finally, we called him, and we just, we just kept doing this. We just kept speaking to his storm and speaking to his heart in the middle of that storm. And just through those conversations, his life got back on track. He ended up repenting of, of that season of rebellion, that season of just not making God center of his life and all that that caused in his life. He got involved in a church again, and he started walking with the Lord again. And he's just like, man, he goes, I felt like I was running from God, and I thought I must have been 100 miles away, and I turn around, and he's literally right there 
right there. And his life was restored through encouragement. Right? That's what's happening here. We were able to be like the voice of Jesus to his storm through God's word. Say, Chris, God can work this for the good. God won't waste your pain. It's okay. God is arranging this, and it's his mercy to bring you back to himself. It, wouldn't, it would be a lack of mercy to allow you to just continue to enjoy your sin and wander from him and run from him for years. Instead, he allowed this storm to come in your life to bring you back home. And just speaking that into him just created life. And that's what God's word does. That's what encouragement does. It builds, it creates life, and it stops storms, and it stops death. So how did Jesus respond to the storm? Sleeping, but also stopping with his word. Jesus' response to his disciples. Let's look at that. Jesus asks two questions to his disciples that I think would be good for us to analyze. He speaks to the storm, storm stops, and then he turns to him and he said, Why are you so afraid? And have you still no faith? Let's talk about each one of these questions and, and maybe how it relates to us as well. Why are you so afraid? I mean, think about it. Now that we know who Jesus is, they literally had Jesus in their boat, and these guys are freaking out. They have God in their boat, and they're freaking out about this storm. Why are you so afraid, disciples? Why are you so afraid, God's people? Why are you so afraid, church? And really, there's only one way not to be afraid of something, and that's if there's someone around who's stronger than your enemy. That's what causes the fear to go away, isn't it? I mean, children who are scared at night, they want, what do they want? They want mommy and daddy to come in the room and be with them. And that kind of takes the fear away. And that's really the only way for the fear to dissipate is if you see, oh there's, oh, there's someone here now who's stronger than my enemies. There's someone here now who's stronger than the thing that I'm afraid of. It reminds me of um, my friend Mike, kind of a lanky, lanky teenager, um, not very athletic, and uh, he would get off the school bus, and there was, uh, there was these bullies on the school bus with him, and every day they threatened him, when we get off the bus, Mike, you know, we're going to mess you up, and so, they, you know, first they, they did that, and they kind of beat him up a little bit, and push him around, and, and bully him, and so, you know, Mike just started, like, sitting toward the front, so the, the bus would uh, stop, and he'd get off and just make a run for the house, <laughs> kind of a daily ritual, um, these bullies would get off and they'd, they'd chase him down. And usually when Mike got to his house and got like, you know, on his property, uh, they'd stop and he'd be like, all right, uh, okay, we're not gonna, you made, it. that's your sanctuary, you're safe. I, I, I don't know what happened, but one day, like they just were sick of him winning that race and they just wanted to beat him up. So they, he ran the, kind of through the gate into his yard and they ran right in the yard. He's like, what? So then he's like, I'm going to run in the house. And he runs in the house, and they chase him in his house. I mean, can you imagine how violated you feel, you'd feel with that? And he's literally like running around his living room, like knocking over vases and stuff, and they're running around. He's you know, tripping over the, the ottoman and the couch, and they're running, trying to chase him. They finally catch up to him in the kitchen because Mike got into the kitchen, and he stopped. And the bullies ran into the kitchen right behind him, and right before they grabbed him, they stopped because they're... At the kitchen table, eating a bowl of Cheerios, nay, Golden Grams, <laughs> was Mike's big brother, Vic. And Vic was a tough dude. And Vic knew about, he'd heard about, he'd never seen these guys, heard about these guys, and was really upset at what these guys were doing to his brother. And when they ran in the kitchen, and Vic is sitting there eating that cereal at the table. He just starts trembling with anger. He, have you ever been so angry you don't have words? He's just so upset. And he's looking at these guys. Just He didn't know what to say. He didn't know how to react. You know, do I kill him? Like, what, what do I do right now? But he's got this pent-up anger, and he's just, like, trembling. And as Mike told me the story, Vic takes his fist, and he pounds the table. And he says, why won't you leave them alone? And the table shakes and then a little bit of milk spills out of the bowl. And then, then Vic just lost. It's just like the, the floodgates of his emotions came out. He just lost all control. And he smashes the table again, he smashes the bowl. And the cereal and, and golden grams just sprays all over his face. There's milk dripping off his face. And he's staring at these guys. And he's like, why won't you leave him alone? 
And that was it. <laughs> they did leave him alone. They ran out of that house, and they never, ever bothered Mike again. What happened? Somebody stronger than the bullies was in the room in that moment. And that ended the storm, didn't it? It, ended the, it gave him peace. He knew, I'm going to be okay because my big brother Vic's here. And you know, I think sometimes when storms come into our lives, we start getting afraid. Just like the disciples turn to Jesus, we turn to Jesus. And I think Jesus is sitting there because he takes it. You know how personally he takes it? I want you to think about this. A little side note. Remember when Paul the Apostle was Saul before he became Paul and got saved and he was murdering Christians? Remember when that light knocked him on the ground and blinded him? The voice said this. He said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me. Who was he persecuting? Christians. And Jesus said, you're persecuting me. Jesus takes your persecution and your trouble personally because we're united with him and he's our big brother, Vic. And so what happens when we go through storms and go through pain and turn to Jesus, I think sort of metaphorically, Jesus is staring at our enemies in heaven, sitting at the right hand of the Father eating a huge bowl of golden grams, like true, really actual gold, golden like grams of gold. He's eating it, and he looks at our enemies, and he pounds that table, and, and holy milk just sprays everywhere in heaven, and he says, why won't you leave her alone? Why won't you leave him alone? And that's it. Amen. Man, I love my amen corner over there. You have no rival, right? You have no equal. He silenced the boast of sin and grave. Okay, I didn't know the lyrics, but he's, right? We sang that this morning. So he said, he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? And he says to us, why are you so afraid? And look back at the beginning of the text, by the way. When evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. Think about that. Jesus said, we're going to the other side. If Jesus said, we're going to the other side, they're going to go to the other side. <laughs> they needed to trust in what he said. And there's promises, gospel promises all over our lives for us about God's goodness, God's faithfulness to lead us and shape us and work things for the good. And in a sense, we need to hold on to those, prom those gospel promises like they should have held on to the fact that Jesus in plain language said, hey guys, let's go to the other side. And if Jesus, God himself, is in the boat with you, you go make it to the other side. I remember uh, when we traveled to Turkey some years back, uh, we used to work with uh, Turkic Asian Creative Outreach. Okay, that is Taco. They need a new name. But we'd work with them and we'd do, at the time I was involved in full-time music and speaking ministry and we went over there and with our band and we did like a multi-city tour over there with Taco. Anyway, we had a guy with us who had been like the seasoned missionary to Turkey. He was kind of on our team to kind of help be a liaison for us in the whole country. Uh, he's sitting next to, there was, at the time there was only 4,000 Christians in Turkey and he happened to be sitting next to one of them, a young Christian on the plane as we're heading over the Atlantic from the United States back for her, back to her homeland in uh, Turkey, in Istanbul. She is trembling on the plane and uh, he, he actually cited this, this text of scripture. He grabbed her on the hand. He said, you know what? He goes, I want to show you something. He goes, look around with me. He says, see that guy up there? He's part of my team. We're going to your country to preach the gospel. He said, oh, see that, that girl over there? She's on team too. He's on the team. All these people on this plane, on this team, we're going over to your country to preach, to obey Jesus because he told us to go and to preach the gospel. Jesus told us to go to Turkey. He said, you don't have to worry about it. This plane's going to land in Turkey. And that, that's what the disciples should have said. That's why they shouldn't have been afraid. He says, why are you so afraid? And maybe today you feel like you're one of the disciples with your storm. You feel like you have weak faith. And let's remember that in that story I just told you, you've got Bob and the, the woman he was talking to from Turkey. Bob had strong faith. She had weak faith. But at the end of the day, was the level of their faith actually relevant at all? What was the most relevant thing to whether or not the plane landed safely in Turkey? The, the plane and how well the plane, how safe the plane was and the, and the pilot, right? So actually, the person with weak faith and the person with strong faith both got the same reward in the end. 
because it was really about the pilot and it was about the, the captain. And so it is with Jesus in our lives. Maybe you feel like you've got weak faith and there's other people in the church who have strong faith and we're right to encourage each other and we should definitely encourage each other in our faith. But at the end of the day, the person with weak faith and the person with strong faith end up in the same destination and get the same reward because it's about our captain. And so let's switch to the next question. He said, why are you so afraid? Then he said, have you still no faith? Now, what exactly is he saying here? Faith in what? Because faith doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? Faith has an object. So what is he asking them exactly to have his faith in? Have their faith in? And I'm going to answer that with a story. Probably one of the most sad experiences of my teenage years was when a friend of mine and Heidi's named James Mortarana died in a car accident. Tragic situation where he was 15 years old in New York. You're not allowed to have a permit or a license in New York. He took his grandma's car and drove it around uh, the town. His dad, who was on a golf course, a good friend of ours too, Tony, heard about it and tried to track his son down. And, and he heard he was in this certain part of town. And he, he drove up to where his son was. And his son saw his dad in the other car coming to that parking lot. It was like a, a convenience store or something. And, and uh, his son was driving the car out of the lot. And he saw his dad. And, and so he didn't look the other way. And he, and he quick saw his dad, and he wanted to get away from his dad, and he drove out into the street right into oncoming traffic, and his father held him in his arms as he, as he died. And it was just, uh, it was going to his funeral, it was just, it was, it was just tragic, and, and um, one of the most moving, inspiring, sad, traumatic experiences of my teenage years. Well, I mentioned Tony was a friend of ours, and we did a lot of traveling during those days, and, and uh, I, I was pro- we were probably in our early 20s by that time, yeah, so uh, we, we were doing the traveling thing, so we, we stayed with Tony about a year, maybe 18 months after his son's death. We were in his area, and, and, and Tony let us stay in his house, so I had to ask. I said, Tony, bro, <laughs> how, how, are you, how are you getting through this? How, how do you lose something this precious in your life? And Tony cited this story that we're reading today. He said, you remember that story where Jesus was in the boat sleeping in the storm? And then he woke up and he calmed the storm. Yeah, he said, and he said to them, you have little faith? I said, yeah, yeah, I remember that. He said, you know what I've learned? He said, Jesus wasn't asking them to have the bravery to stand up and rebuke the storm like he did. That's not the faith he was asking them to have. The faith he wanted them to have was that since he was in the boat with them, that they'd be okay. He wanted their faith in him, not their spiritual power or spiritual gifts, but he wanted their faith in his presence. He says, that's what's holding us right now. Jesus, and we had tears with him. It still brings up tears. Jesus is in our boat. He said, Jesus is in our boat. And we're getting to the other side. Faith, again, we don't preach faith in faith. And there's a lot of that going on in our country today, in, in modern Western church. Faith in faith. Faith in your strength, your spiritual power, your, your ability to name it and claim it. You know, you are the prophet of your own life, that kind of a thing. And, and that can really get off the rails. What the gospel teaches is not faith in faith, but faith in Christ. He is the object of our faith. Because the object of your faith is everything. Everybody in our society has faith question is, what is your faith in? And does the object of your faith produce for you what it promises? When I was a teenager, I, I, before I knew I was a wrestler, I tried basketball. Um, and, I mean, I'll, I'll, it's probably another story for another day, but the last game of the year, I was the kid where, hey, put Derek in. You know, I was Rudy. And they, and they, <laughs> and they put me down on one end of the court and everybody else on the, on the other side of the court so they could get the rebound and throw me the ball so I could try to score. They threw me the ball, and with the clock expiring by some miracle of physics, I put it in, and they carried me off the floor. And anyway, so I, I knew that um, I was not, that was not my future, so uh, the next year I tried wrestling, and uh, here we are. You know, it's God, God has his ways. But, but uh, c- convinced that at some point in that process, convinced that I just needed the right shoes. In 1983, 12 years old, um, 
there was a commercial for shoes called Converse Fast Break. And if you just get those shoes, your basketball game goes up like five notches. So I convinced my parents to buy me these very expensive shoes, these Converse Fast Break shoes, and I got the shoes. And, and the, the first testing grounds, if you live in a small town in New York like I did, is you call Kenny Wetzel and Trent Schiffendecker, right? That's what you do. So I called Kenny and Trent, and I said, guys, I said, you got to meet me down at the court for some b-ball because I got Converse Fast Break shoes right now. See you down there. And I went down, and you know exactly how that went. I now was a terrible basketball players, player with very expensive Converse fast break shoes. Here's the point of the story. So I had faith. I had faith because I believed this commercial, this lie, that if I got Converse fast break shoes, it was going to improve my game. And it did not. So the object of my faith did not produce for me what it promised. And many people live their lives like that. Oh, if I could just get this relationship then I'll be happy. If I could just get this achievement, this career, if I could reach this goal in my life, then I'll be happy. And they get that thing and they miss the shot. And they realize these shoes aren't giving me what was promised on the commercial. Jesus is the only object of faith. He says, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give your souls rest. Come to me and I'll give you salvation. Jesus is the only object of faith in life that we can truly trust in, who is reliable. And so when Jesus said, have you still no faith? He wasn't asking them to be these great superhero Christians. He was asking them in humility to trust his presence, to trust in him and in his salvation for them. So that's his response to his disciples, these two questions. He removes their fear by reminding them of who he is. And he points their faith in the right direction, and that is in him. And finally, what's our response to Jesus? What's our response to Jesus? So kind of booting from the last point about faith, I guess the question then is, what does it mean to have faith in Jesus? And it means simply this. To have faith in Jesus means you have faith in who he is and what he has done. And by the way, all false teaching violates one of those two points. Either they mess up who Jesus is or they mess up what Jesus has done. The true gospel of grace brings us to that place where we grasp who Jesus is and we have our faith in him. He is our savior. He is the son of God in the flesh. He is our, he is our salvation. And then what he's done, that we're saved by grace through faith, not by works. Not legalism, not moralism, not my resume. His resume, his performance, not mine. His grace not my strength. So it means to have faith in who he is and what he's done. So briefly, who is he? And you know, I, I, could, I could quickly go through this part of the message, but let me just stop and say, pause and say, what I just asked you is the most important question you'll ever answer in life. Who is Jesus? It was important in Jesus' day to the point where he pressed it on his disciples and said, who do men say, to, say that I am? And they answered. And then he said, who do you say that I am? That's an important question. He presses that on our hearts. Jesus' own claims about himself, like the idea that Jesus is God in the flesh was not conjured up by like, you know, I don't know, monks in a monastery, you know, in the 1200s who wanted to trick the world and deceive the world. Uh, Literally, Jesus made these claims about himself. An example, he was talking to the religious leaders in his day, and he said, Abraham longed to see my day, and he saw it and rejoiced. And they said, you are not yet 50 years old and you have seen Abraham. Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. And the Bible says, then he wanted to throw him off a cliff. Why why would would it go from a a semi-cordial conversation to let's murder him immediately? Because he said, before Abraham was, I am. He was claiming to be God and he actually claimed it in a way where he used the same name of God, I am, that God used with Moses at the burning bush. Moses said, well, I'll go to Pharaoh, but who shall I say sent me? God said, I am that I am. And then Jesus here, in the opening days of his ministry, conversing with the religious leaders who eventually did kill him, he said, before Abraham was, I am. They knew exactly what he was doing, and he knew exactly what he was doing. He was claiming to be God in the flesh. And so we put our faith in him and who he is. There's this famous uh, 
mini-sermon by a man named Dr. S.M. Lockridge. He was asked to come and, and speak at a political gathering. He only had a few moments. And so uh, here's, here's what Lockridge said in his few moments he had. And it, this is really kind of worship. So if you want to kind of worship God with me as we're kind of reading through this. He stood up and he said, He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He stands alone in himself. You can trust him. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He's supreme. He's preeminent. He's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest idea in philosophy. He's the fundamental truth in theology. He's the miracle of the age. He's the only one able to supply all of our needs simultaneously. You can trust him. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the aged. He rewards the diligent. He beautifies the meek. Do you know him? Lockridge said, you can trust him. Well, my king is a king of knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway to deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. He's the master of the mighty. He's the captain of the conquerors. He's the head of the heroes. He's the leader of the legislators. He's the overseer of the overcomers. He's the governor of the governors. He's the prince of princes. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. You can trust him. His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. You could trust him. Well, I wish I could describe him to you, but he's indescribable. Yes, he's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. I'm trying to tell you, the heavens cannot contain him, let alone man explain him. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't get him off your hands. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him. But they found out that they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. That's my king. You can trust him. He's always been and he always will be. I'm talking about he who had no predecessor and he who has no successor. There was nobody before him and there will be nobody after him. You can't impeach him and he's not going to resign. We try to get prestige and honor and glory to ourselves, but the glory is all his. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever. How long is that? And ever and ever and ever and ever. And when you get through all the forevers and then amen, you can trust him. And God's people said, amen. amen. And what has he done? I'll finish with this. His three words on the cross that should give us daily and tremendous comfort. When Jesus was on the cross at the moment of his death, he said, it is finished. Now, those words were significant, very significant in that day, as those were the same words that a tax collector would use when a debt was paid in full. So Jesus, right before his death, looks at heaven and preaches to the world, it is finished. He finished the work of our salvation. He finished the work of our justification, our standing before God. It's the same words that a master would say to a servant if he inspected the work and it was fully done. It is finished. Jesus paid the entire debt and he did all the work. And now we put faith in him, who he is and what he has done. And when we do that, the Bible says that we are justified. That means to be made right in the eyes of God, in the eyes of God's law. We are justified by faith. And that is the great message of the church. That's a great doctrine. That's the good news of salvation. It, this truth is so important that Martin Luther said, justification by faith is the article by which the church stands or falls. And you can insert your name in there. Justification by faith is the article by which Derek stands or falls. It's the article by which redeeming hope stands or falls. If we lose justification by faith in Christ, we lose the church. 
We could actually, we could gather together, we could do programs and stuff, but we cease to be a Christian church because that is the center of the Christian gospel of good news. So what is our response to Jesus? Faith. Trust. We trust that he's in our boat. He's the master of the storm. He is the king of kings that has come to this world and preached the kingdom to us, and he's invited us into it. Amen? Three quick applications. How do we respond to this message? Number one, build your faith like a muscle. You know, I, I got a Planet Fitness. I know some of you do too, Planet Fitness membership. You go down there, people are working out their muscles. Faith is like a muscle. It's an instrument that God uses to bring grace to you and bring spiritual power into your life. So I want to encourage you to exercise your faith like a muscle. How do we do that? By reading the Word of God and hearing the Word of God, by gathering together together, Uh, like we are today and hearing God's word or encouraging one another in groups and just any way that we can hear the word of God and interact with it in a way where we're letting it get down in there, we're exercising our faith. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Also, put your faith into practice. Use your spiritual gifts, right? Call that person, encourage them, pray for them, reach out, open your mouth and share the good news of Christ with someone. Engage in your life of prayer with the Lord. Serve in your gift ministry in the church or in the community and say, God, use me in this. And what what are we doing? We're building our faith like a muscle. Number two, don't look at the storm, look at Jesus. Can I just be real honest and practical with you? Like this, this, this week got real practical for me right? We're in a time right now when there's a lot of financial pressure and I, I tend to like look at our bank accounts depleting and like how things are going. You know, I, I, I kind of like look at my apps and my numbers and I felt like the Lord said to me, you need to look at Matthew 6 instead of your apps, which says, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. So when I, when I have an instinct to look at my bank account or look at, you know, my investments and how things are going, I've been, I've grabbed my phone and instead I open my Bible app and I look at Matthew 6. Because I want to look at Jesus. I don't want to look at my storm. I want to look at Christ. So for you, whatever that looks like for you, look at Jesus, not your storm. And finally, worship and pray when facing your fears. You know, maybe it's a little corny, but it, I, I think it works, right? I think we need to stop, how's it go? Stop telling God how big our problems are, right? And start telling our problems how big our God is. So turn to Christ in worship. Rec- Recognize him in a way where you're in awe and you go, who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Even my trial obeys him. Wow, what a God, what a Savior, what a Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love that we see in this text. We thank you for your grace that we see in this text. Help us, Lord, to hear it with spiritual ears and I pray it would go down to deep places like like it must like it did and must have in the disciples, that we walk out of this place in awe of you and grateful for the salvation that we have received. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening. We gather every Sunday at the Clarksville area YMCA. For more information, please go to our website at redeeminghope.org.